I'm Stacy Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Cantor. And you're listening to True Tales from Old Houses, the mini sode Hey, Daniel, how's your stress level today? Oh, it's high. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, new here, uh, I have been working on the same house for just shy of a decade, and it is going to be for sale in the real time of our recording in two days. So when this episode comes out, the house is listed. That'll be old news, right? I mean, we'll be in contract. It'll all be, just all be done. I can't wait to hear. Yeah, so I am kind of shaking in my boots, but I've been rolling out the rooms on Instagram one by one, which has been really fun and also like just the sweetest. I've just been so verklempt over like so many really, really kind comments. It's the farewell tour kind of, isn't it? Uh, Kind of, yeah. So I have so many pictures and so much to say about this house. So um, I'm sure I will continue to post about it. I do want to hear all about it. But before we continue, I want to thank our mini sewed sponsors. Yes. The Window Course from Scott Seidler of the Craftsman blog and Sutherland Wells. Thanks, guys. So you staged the cottage in real time. By the time this comes out, it'll be on the market. We've talked about how you approach staging and you've been rolling out the rooms on Instagram. How does that feel at this point? You said it makes you happy to see the pictures out. I'm sure it's like a full circle moment, right? Maybe you've had a lot of this in your head for a long time. Yeah, it's a little crazy. I feel like with projects like this, like the house was renovated in my mind, you know, eight years ago. So to finally actually see it come together is really cool, obviously for me. And then I think for, I didn't appreciate sort of how near and dear this project has been to a whole bunch of strangers. So like, that's been just so nice. And um, yeah, it's fun how like, People have different kind of associations with different rooms and stuff. Like I renovated the kitchen basically right as COVID hit. I was posting stories about it all the time. I got a lot of followers at the time because I think everyone was just kind of like looking for that kind of thing. And so a lot of people, you know, remember that or remember some other significant life event while I was in the midst of some other thing. And, you know, if they were pregnant when I got the house, they now have a healthy fifth grader, hopefully. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's really been a journey. Good point. None of this has happened on soap opera time, has it? If it had been soap opera time, then you would have bought the house last year. And this year, they would have had a healthy fifth grader. So yeah, right. And HGTV, I would have bought it like two weeks ago. Um, right. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, it's yeah, so I feel really good about the staging. I, I, I love how it came out. And like with the rest of the renovation, that's sort of just the standard I held myself to. Do I like it or not? So that was enjoyable. I think the photography, I haven't seen any of the pictures, but I think it went very well. They spent several hours, but hopefully I made their jobs easy-ish without having to, you know, move a ton of stuff and whatever. I'm sure you did. I don't know. It's just, ah, I don't know. I have no words. It's crazy. How has the process been listing it for sale? Like I, you've spent all this time getting it prepped and now you have a realtor. Like I'm just trying to imagine how that whole thing came together. It's interesting. And I was like not incredibly prepared for it. So basically they've needed like some things for me, like the deed and a copy of this and a copy of that. I've never been on this side of things. I bought three properties and never sold a property. So I don't know how like normal all of this is, but I, there's a government form you fill out and then they sent me a big long kind of seller's packet with all the relevant information about the house. They were like, you've done so much. So don't even worry about the list of improvements. We need that as a separate document. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, It is a textbook. And then one of the, my big remaining tasks, you know, with my day and a half before it goes live is pricing the interior stuff. So I'm, I'm hoping to sell the cottage at least partially furnished. It feels unlikely to me that somebody would really want like everything, but 
I would. I would. I'm making the option available. So I would like your house and everything in it, so I don't have to ever think about that sort of thing again. Thank you very much. You're my perfect buyer, except you're not in the market. So <laughs> that is true. Oh, 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 that old thing. Yeah, that that's old true. Thing. But you know, maybe you need a downstate vacation property. Um, <laughs> So it's been very cool. It's so strange to be in there and like using the pull-out kitchen trash. Like it's like a real functional, actual house. Right. And this last crush of getting everything ready, you were basically working a room at a time, but also scooting everything to (laughs) other rooms. So you have never had the whole house just open and clear and finished and you just wander around like an adult or something, right? In your fancy house. In my fancy house. And then I go home to my house and it's, (laughs) I still have not really put things back together. Um, I've had to have a real kind of come to Jesus on how many items are in this home (laughs) because for so many years I had this great like excuse of you know I'm gonna have to stage this whole house so I need all these and oh boy Stacy my hoard room is pretty much still full and uh, oh no kind of doesn't look like I took much out but I did so that might be your easter egg for uh we might need to do some e-commerce soon Oh, you can buy my wares. I bet people would be all over that. That's a great idea. I was going to suggest something different, but I think your idea is, is much better. But I don't know if, have you ever heard of the uh, Swedish art of death cleaning? I think we've kind of briefly <laughs> yes. mentioned it on here. Okay. And watch the show. There was a Netflix show. Oh, I did watch one or two episodes of yeah, that. Yeah, it was fun. I love the Swedes. Oh, God, I love the Swedes. Everything they do. I know. They seem to have it all together, right? So together. Yeah, I could definitely use some death cleaning. I guess I should explain though, right? Oh, right. Sure. (laughs) I threw that out there with no explanation. But anyway, there is a book and a Netflix show. And the Swedish art of death cleaning is basically where you take control of your own stuff, in so many words, so that the people you leave behind do not have that responsibility. And they treat the whole process pretty lightheartedly but the idea is you know you're you're the adult here this stuff is yours you need to I already said it take responsibility for it but you know if things are important to you then now is the time to take care of those and not not after you are gone when you won't even be knowing what's going on right I love the concept it scares me to death like when my house (laughs) gets chaos I don't know if this is normal or something I should say out loud, but I fear that I will die and like somebody is going to have to come in and deal with this. Like (laughs) my bigger fear is less about the dying and more about my mother seeing how I live. (laughs) Not wearing clean underwear or something when they find you or what? (laughs) I mean that or just underwear on the floor or just like, why is... Why is this room so crazy, Daniel? Like, why did you do this? So, yeah. Well, you could write a note and say, you know, dear person who finds me, it, the house is a mess right now because it's all at the cottage. Right. And also, yes. I'm so sorry. So, yes. <laughs> um, hopefully, I don't up and die is the point, I think. Yeah. How did we get here? Because I feel like this conversation took a turn. I hope you don't die too, Daniel. At Thank least you. not before your time. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we will see what happens with the cottage. And that's pretty much that. What is going on with you? Tell me something to make me stop thinking about the things I'm freaked out about. Well, I don't know that I have better news for you. I actually have follow up on something that's that's a little sad, I guess, that I have to share. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm bringing the show, I'm bringing it down just when you need me to be bringing it back up. But we have a diversity of emotions on our minisodes. What's the... Yes, we do. I'm scared. Well, uh, last week, I happened to log into Facebook and I follow the Aurora Restoration Project. And that is famously from our episode of, is it a ship or is it a boat? <laughs> Remember right. that? I did. That was my very first interview on this as co-host. Yeah. That is correct. And we interviewed Christopher Wilson, who was the owner of the Aurora Restoration Project. And he had brought it from, I believe, the San Francisco area. And now it's in the San Joaquin Delta, I think. Can't remember exactly what the Delta is called. 
Yeah. And if memory serves, this was the first cruise ship produced by Germany after World War II, I believe, was the factoid. Ooh, you have a very good memory. All I could come up with that it's a German cruise ship. I'm going to put the episode in our in our show notes, though, so people can go back and listen to it. Well, the news was on Facebook that, sadly, the Aurora is sinking. It got a hole. And now when you think sinking, we think of, you know, Titanic level all the way under the water. But this, it, since it's parked in the delta, that's shallow water. But it's basically sunk all the way up to its deck. So it could not what? float right now. I know. Isn't that just horrible, horrible news? So I have so many questions. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, it happened. Yeah, I mean, I was so shocked, too. And I thought, gosh, I'm going to mention this on the show. And then I just felt like I needed to sit back and, and kind of watch what was happening first, you know, before I came on here yeah. and just all crushed and got everybody crushed. It, it's bad news. It's not good news. But basically, Christopher was no longer the owner of the ship, even though we just okay. interviewed him fairly recently. And he had passed on the ship to someone else who he's since come out and said he he completely trusts him. He believes he has the best interest of the ship at heart, feels like he made the right decision. So you know how things in the aftermath, there's all kinds of gossip and blah, blah, blah. So I want to make sure and say that outright is that the new owner was a responsible person who cared very deeply about this ship. But something happened. That's something I don't know. I can't speculate on that. But it, it took on water. And you know how water is. Water always wins. So if something starts, then water is very, very destructive. And it just got to the point where there was nothing to do. The hole was too big to plug. You know, you oh can't just goodness. spread that ceiling on there and call it a day. It's a heavy, <laughs> No, heavy J.B. Ship. Wells is going to fix it. No. This. No, oh. no. So the follow up to that is that I guess there is the hope that they will get that hole plugged, they'll get the water pumped out and get it floating again. But the reality is, that's a big, big task. And the likelihood of it is looking pretty grim, I guess. Yeah. So basically, it's a pile of scrap at this point. That's what it would have to be. That is is horrible that is so sad <laughs> I'm like it is really sad can we I know. take a break <laughs> oh no yeah this let's is... do let's let's do let's take a quick break True Tales from Old Houses is supported by The Window Course. The Window Course, created by Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog, is a step-by-step, do-it-yourself program that will teach you everything you need to know to successfully restore your wood windows. It's self-paced, so you can go as slow or as fast as you need, and there are also several price points to fit your needs and budget. Now that we're headed into the warmer months, it is officially window season. So now is the perfect time to get ready to restore the windows at your house. And the window course has all the information that you need all in one place. Scott is offering his students a special deal. If you sign up for the lifetime access package or training package, then you'll also get a free infrared paint remover, which is a $100 value. The window course comes with a money-back guarantee, and Scott is offering True Tales from Old Houses listeners a special discount. For 10% off, visit thewindowcourse.com and use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Sutherland Wells. All of Sutherland Wells' products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island, with the highest quality, sustainably grown tongue oil. Tongue oil, which is native to China, has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. Said it before, I'll say it again, unlike polyurethane, tongue oil finish actually penetrates the surface of the wood, so it flexes and contracts as the conditions change, which makes it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. You know, I'm a huge fan of the Clarabelle's Plus oil primer combination for window work. I also like the Slicky Wicky, Millie's, Murdoch's. I've tried so many of them. And whatever project you personally are working on, Sutherland Wells has an entire product line. 
This season, you might be working on siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, cutting boards, you name it. So to learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells. That's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code TRUETALES. All right, we're back. And I do have a little bit of a happier follow-up, I guess. That would be nice. It's still about the ship. But if you weren't here for that episode and you haven't listened to it yet, please do go back and listen to it. But we talked about things like the furnishings that Christopher had brought in and and all of the rooms that were already done. Mm-hmm. And the good news is that I believe all of that has been rescued. So none okay. of that has been damaged as far as I know. So anyway, that's the good follow-up is that those things that were in the ship were rescued and are not damaged. Well, that's good. And hopefully, yeah. I mean, I know he said that it had been used as a filming location a lot. So, you know, it'll live on, I suppose, in film and television and all the various ways it's been documented since, I guess, the 40s, probably late 40s. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, that hurts. That is just rough. Anybody who wants to follow along with what happens from this point on or go back in time and see what happened then is they could follow that on Facebook. But I will tell you right now, the Facebook group is beside themselves. a bit of a chaotic nightmare. Yes. Yeah. Not only with just being sad, but also, you know how things are on Facebook. Facebook is toxic. So <laughs> I'm just warning you. Yeah, it's toxic there too. A lot of weird baseless blaming of people that don't deserve it. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yes. That is absolutely correct. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. What a world. Hmm. That is yeah. painful. Well, I think I can speak for Stacy too that we we wish the entire Aurora team the best and we're very sorry to hear about that. Not to just shamelessly bring it back to me, but I I'm very curious about this. So I was talking to Brad yesterday And he was like, so when are all offers due by on the cottage? And I'm like, what in the world do you mean? So I remember about a year ago, one of the houses near Brad at the lake went up for sale and they had this, what I thought was very kind of smart, but also very strange thing where all offers were due within, I don't know, two weeks or something from the listing. And at that, so you're not expected to respond to an offer until 24 hours after that, you know, date passes, and then you do it. And I had never heard of that being done. And I literally thought it was like, just for that house. And I thought it was kind of weird, but okay. Apparently, that's just how all houses are sold in Rochester. So I'm wondering, Stacy, is that how things work around you? That is actually a good question. And I know of that technique more when you have kind of a high demand house Mm -hmm. or when there's not a lot of houses on the market. So Mm -hmm. when I look at the real estate in Salt Lake, I occasionally see that on a house with high demand, maybe in a really hot area. There aren't a ton of houses available, so they might take that house and do that. I've seen that here where I live outside of Buffalo for the same reason. But I think it has to do with maybe a certain price bracket too. I don't really know, but I know that it's happened before when it's when it's a seller's market. But no, it's not the way it always is as far as I know, but it is a way and it is been more common, I think, lately. Yeah. It was also more likely when we bought our house here, Blake Hill House, because we actually had to do the same thing. All bids were due at five o'clock on such and such a day. And then the lawyers Mm -hmm. from the estate reviewed all the offers and then made a decision from that. And somehow we won. That was a big mess. Talk about chaotic and stressful. But Oh, mine mine was a a estate as well. I don't think we've ever really talked about this. No, I don't think so. I've mentioned it on the podcast before, before you became the co-host. I've talked a little bit about it. But yeah, we, you and I have never spoken about that stressful situation. Of- we got to swap closing stories. Mine was nuts. Um, oh, mine was a nightmare too. All of that makes total sense to me. I totally understand the logic and certainly the benefit to the seller. It sounds amazing. But uh, I've just never heard of that being done around here and 
interestingly, because like that does make total sense in a hot seller's market for them to do it that way. But we have a pretty hot seller's market and that's not happening here. And Brad said that it was that way when he bought his house, which was, I don't know, 13 years ago. And that was not a hot market. And even still, I mean, the house was $67,000, I think. I know now Rochester, New York is actually like, if not the hottest, one of the hottest real estate markets in the country, which is just wild. So I don't know. We bought this house 11 years ago. So we were in the same time frame, I guess, as Brad was buying Mm -hmm. his bungalow. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I know it as a way, but you are the seller. You get to do exactly what you want. Right. (laughs) Based on what your agent tells you is what you want to do. That's, yeah, this is why I hired a professional. I think, yeah, the only thing I really know about this, I looked into it, I remember when the I was on the land bank and we sold 111 Downs, which actually I have an update about, and I suggested that we we, we run it this way because it was similar to the way that we would have run like a request for proposals, you know, all offers do by a certain date but instead of an offer it'd be a proposal cut that out it's boring but i know a it is you know typical to respond to an offer within 24 to 48 hours b many times an offer will have a like expiration on it the offer is only good for 24 hours right. so you could not accept it and just hope that they're still waiting in the wings but you're certainly taking a risk right Mm-hmm. And when I suggested we do it this way to the agents on that property, they just looked at me like I had three heads. And it is what we ended up doing, <laughs> but it was highly abnormal for this area, I guess. It's so it's so interesting. It is. And I can tell you, as someone who is considering buying in the Salt Lake City market, that is completely frustrating because you just know – I'm not saying on a personal level, this is how a buyer thinks. I'm just, I'm using buyer and seller as the two people who are in this transaction. Okay. I'm not making a value judgment about a seller and their personality and how they really see it. (laughs) Certainly. Okay. But as the buyer, you know, it's annoying to know that they're just waiting for something better than what you said you would give them. Right. Right. And it's, it's adversarial, (laughs) which they are. Buying and selling real estate automatically sets you up in this very adversarial relationship, which is stressful. So the sooner it's over, the better, I say. I mean, this is why a big reason why I hired an agent for a long time actually thought that I was going to do a for sale by owner. And the two things that really kind of stopped me from that was number one, I already learned how to like rebuild a house, basically. I don't need to also learn how to sell a house. That's okay. That's funny. So (laughs) that was one thing. And then the other thing that I realized was like, typically you talk through the attorneys and the agents. And I think that would have been okay. But then it occurred to me that for two of my three purchases, I've used the seller's agent. And if I didn't have an agent, then that would be me. And it's not something I want to do because I really like people. It is both my dream and my nightmare that like a follower of mine buys the house because I'm not in a position to do any favors for anyone. So like this is highest bid, period, end of story. Yeah, I get it. Just on a personal level, especially if I was dealing with somebody who... I have a fondness for her and they have a fondness for me because they followed me all these years and whatever. Like, I, 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 ju- I don't have it in me to be like, no. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Yeah, to do a favor. So I have a question for you. You said something. I want to make sure I understood this correctly. You uh-oh. bought three houses and you did not have your own realtor. You used the seller's realtor. That's correct. Yeah. And I, I know that that is generally bad advice and I'm not here to give advice on how to <laughs> buy a house because I think things are different. But when I bought my house, I just, you know, called the number on the listing, which of course was the the seller's agent. The seller in my case, like I mentioned, was a a state. So, you know, it had been her listing for I think almost two years or so at that point. And the market was not good. So it kind of felt to me, and I think maybe this is a little bit of an old house thing too, is like I know I'm getting into something crazy. 
I did get an inspection, but also like, it's a cheap house. It's an old house. The seller is dead. What am I going to ask for, you know, as a contingency right. or something? So it just, it didn't feel like it made a ton of sense. And it actually, I think a little bit worked in my favor because to the extent that anyone might have cared, it was clear that, you know, I really cared about the house and I really wanted to restore the house. And I, I hope that might have been appealing to whoever on the seller side was making this decision. But it also, I think, cut down. This happened particularly with a duplex. So same thing. I It was the seller's agent who I had met before. It's not a very big place, Kingston. So, you know, right. don't put your trust in somebody who doesn't seem trustworthy, but I liked him. It cut down on a lot of back and forth because I was basically like, I'll give you this. And he was like, I know they're not going to take that. So, you know, but I think they could probably. So it just, it made it a little easier, I think. Yeah, I can see that. I don't think it's the worst thing you can do is the point. No. And you brought up a good point too about knowing what you were getting into. And that happened with us too. We are offering to lawyers of an estate they are not going to negotiate. It's right. just you're paying this amount and here's your house. You know, we also had an inspection, but it didn't really matter. The inspection was more for us to know how to prioritize all the things that needed to be done if we ended up purchasing the house. It had nothing to do with us saying, well, this is broken and we're going to negotiate some a reduction in the price or, right. you know, you need to fix this before we move in because... They had already cashed that check. They were not interested in helping us make this house better. And that's just how it works sometimes. And I, I kind of get that too with an old house. I mean, what are you going to do? It just right. is what it is to a certain degree. And if you see that, then you either buy it or you don't. When I closed, so the house is, was being sold by this estate of the former owner. And I don't know if this is normal. In New York, they only run the title search after you're in contract, which is so crazy to me because it's like, so now is when you're going to figure out if you have the legal right to convey this deed to someone, but okay. That's why it takes so long in the state of New York. They're doing the legwork after when they should have done the legwork before. Yeah. So this was a, what was supposed to be a 30 day closing and it dragged on for, I think about four months up to the point that I'm not sure how honest I ever was about this, but when I bought my house, kind of the only way I was affording this house was being able to rent my apartment on Airbnb in Brooklyn. And so my ex and I at the time thought that, um, you know, we were going to close on this house. We'd have a few months to kind of get the house up and running and do, you know, the roof and the stuff and have hot water and all these things. Um, and then come early summer, we would be renting the apartment and able to comfortably stay here. However, it kept getting delayed. So we had this Airbnb booking and it was like a three weeks or something. And it was starting Monday, June 3rd. And it is now Thursday, May 30th. And I'm like, we have got to close on this house or we are going to be homeless. Like this is kind of crisis. And so we like very nearly drove to my parents or something because we were like, we literally don't have a place to be. But it got, we kind of pushed it through. But what ended up happening was that the estate thought that there were like two heirs or something. And then they ran the title and figured out that the, the it was something like the couple that had, you know, owned the house for the past 40 years were never actually married. And so therefore there was like a whole other group of next of kin. Oh, goodness. And they didn't have kids, so these were all, like, either siblings or cousins or, like, something. So they're all super old. They're all in nursing homes. And every single one of these, like, nine people have to agree to sell this gorgeous historic house for $85,000 in a, like, and they probably don't even know they have some kind of ownership stake in this house. But I'm sure they have all these questions about why it's so cheap. And, you know, it was right. so stressful and, like, intense. And that's why when I actually started staying in the house like the water you know we got here on that day that the rental started down in the city and the water had been turned on two hours before we got here everything was burst like it was oh, really yeah, yeah. trial by fire in a way that it was not supposed to be oh my gosh fond memories I'll cherish always Yes, yes. One day I'll share with you how we filled our basement with sewer. 
within the first week that we moved in after we closed. But we are out of time for today. Well, I can't wait to hear it. But until then, I am so excited your house will be on the market. I'm wishing you nothing but full price offers and above and that this is soon behind you and you can look at it all with great fondness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses, the mini-sode. Until next time, see you on Monday.